Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. With that, we move on to the panel discussion titled Enabling the Shift to Less Harmful Alternatives, Evidence-Based Policy Recommendations. And first, it's my honor and privilege to welcome and introduce the members of the panel. David T. Sweener, JD, Faculty of Law and Center for Health Law, Policy and Ethics, University of Ottawa, Canada. Dr. Kiran Melkote, orthopedic surgeon who's based in Delhi and a member of the Association for Harm Reduction, Education and Research. Dr. K. Madan Gopal, senior consultant health, Niti Ayo, National Institute for Transforming India. And Sharifa Eza Wanpute, professor of hospital management and health economics, deputy dean relation and wealth creation. Faculty of Medicine, UKM Medical Center, previous head of International Center for Case Mix and Clinical Coding, UKM Medical Center, Malaysia. This panel will be moderated by Rainy Simon Khanna, former TV and radio news anchor, media person, voice of the metros. Rainy, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan, for the introductions. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, as you've heard, tobacco harm reduction remains a controversial topic in tobacco control. Tobacco causes about 8 million avoidable deaths and is responsible for over 12% of premature deaths globally. In India, tobacco use in various forms decreases life expectancy by 11 years among women and around 12 years in men. Failure to rapidly implement global tobacco control measures is predicted to result in 1 billion tobacco related deaths in the 21st century. The first World No Tobacco Day was held 34 years ago in 1988. And over these three decades, little has changed in terms of mindsets or strategy. Around us, risky health behaviors still run rampant. And this year's theme, Commit to Quit, is complete with a slick toolkit of information, which includes counseling, nicotine replacement, mobile apps, hotlines, and text message support, in the hope with that we will achieve what could not have been done so far. This strategy, while commendable, ignores the reality of nicotine addiction, which is that even though almost 70% uh, of smokers wish to quit, only 7% manage to. This single piece of information should be itself alarming to those who see smoking as simply a choice or view smokers who cannot quit as being less committed to quitting. For those who indulge in substance abuse, how can we enable them to make the switch to less harmful substances or alternatives? One must remember that substance abuse does not mean that people forfeit their human rights. They remain entitled to the right to life, to the highest attainable standard of health, to social services, to privacy, to freedom from arbitrary detention and uh, freedom from cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment, among others. So what is the impact of the alternate choices if offered on the individual and on community health? It's a complex question and deserves to be approached from a 360 degree perspective. Our discussion today, I'm hoping, will touch upon various aspects of harm reduction practice and the offer of alternative products as a choice and Fortunately, I am joined by some subject matter experts who were introduced earlier by Ivan uh, to help me do just that. So let me begin at home with Dr. Madan Boba. Harm reduction, sir, is not an alien concept to India and has been successfully used in battling HIV, AIDS, drug addiction, etc. But there is a continued resistance to tobacco harm reduction as a viable strategy in addressing or mitigating tobacco damage to smokers who want to quit but simply cannot. 
Could you, sir, share some of the steps taken in India to help them transition to less harmful methods of getting nicotine with an eventual goal of tobacco secession? Uh, Rini, it's a very complex question to answer because uh, we are dealing with complexities. Uh, are we talking about uh, quitting smoking or are we talking ab about uh, quitting tobacco chewing and uh, consumption of tobacco? We have to take into this account the efforts which have been made in the past. We do have a national health policy which uh, and we such that there has to be 30% reduction in tobacco consumption. Being signatory to the WHO uh, convention and we do have two acts, the uh, uh, COPTA and the uh, food, uh, food and uh, Drug Adulteration Act, which usually regulates uh, this tobacco. Apart from that, uh, there are many measures which have been taken uh, by the, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, which has, uh, now we have seen a decrease in public smoking, the kind of thing is visible in the urban, urban sphere. But we, are we only targeting the smokers or are we targeting the tobacco? Because if you look at the consumption of the tobacco, it is going up. It, it has uh, gone up, uh, I think around uh, 250 million uh, people would be now consuming tobacco and the number is going on. Because the availability is rampant. Because if you go to a rural area, in rural area, even the, the children watch there, and that's the most dangerous trend which is happening and we have to see that how we prevent that thing. If you go to, a, if you do a survey in a high school, you will find that uh, what has happened, what has happened, they would be having pouches of uh, this uh, tobacco in their pockets. It starts from that, eight, nine years children, they are now coming into this fold. And if you talk about uh, the harm reduction, having a substitute for tobacco, for HIV AIDS program, the number was less. As a result, you could have a substitution therapy, opiate substitution therapy. But what are the substitutes which are available for uh, nicotine? So their number is very limited. Do we have the capacity to have a substitution therapy for all these numbers? The numbers are very high. Apart from that, uh, the available patches and the, the VAPs which are available, the delivery of nicotine is very high. And uh, we require some scientific evidence saying that uh, regulated delivery of nicotine is available. And the harmful effects of nicotine are now available in the form of uh, uh, the oral cancer is also increasing. I'm not talking about uh, limited to smoking. Uh, you see the mental issues are also on the rise as well as the spurge in the sp infertility clinics. They, they can all be directly or directly attributed to uh, this uh, tobacco consumption. So, uh, tobacco harm reduction, in initially it has to be focused on raising awareness. By awareness, you might have seen the shift. Previously, the Bollywood actor used to say that the cigar smoking and a hero machoistic image. Now, the same kind of machoistic personality, they say that case, that, that kind of change has happened in the last 14, 15 years. We have to see that ki, how we take it to the next level, make awareness, see that the availability and other things are restricted nearby the vicinity of the schools and other places where the actual induction into the tobacco chewing starts. So journey is very tough, very complex, and we have we, we can find solution. But uh, having spent for the uh, uh, replacement of uh, nicotine as a substitute for smoking, so do we have the numbers? If you take the cost of quitting smoking and the cost of chewing tobacco, the cost effective way for the poor person, the most of the rural population, they will not uh, go with the other substitute products. That's another aspect which we need to consider when we are this. But as of now, we don't have a policy for uh, uh, this uh, substitution, nicotine substitution products. And uh, we are very clear because uh, we require some evidence because the propellant itself is also carcinogenic and we require, we need studies to, we need to wait for the studies to uh, come with the facts. On that. And the second thing, the delivery of the nicotine, the level of nicotine, which is delivered through these propellants and the other place. We don't know what quantity of uh, uh, nicotine is there. With a less absorbed uh, this nicotine, now you are giving a uh, refined nicotine. So the effects, we don't know. We require more evidence for that. I will stop here. 
rather grim scenario, uh, Dr. Madan Gopal. Um, I'll move on to uh, David. I've asked you this before, David. Uh, uh, as you were listening to Dr. Madan Gopal, were you thinking that India has missed a public health opportunity with the bans that we have on e-cigarettes, um, ENDS and heated tobacco products, etc.? cetera? Uh, and how do you think South Asian countries like India can learn from other successful nations, um, say like Japan, for instance, which has successfully seen a 42% decline in smoking rates in just about five years. Is India willing to learn? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, it is a, a terribly missed opportunity that we don't know everything about all the different types of nicotine products, but we do know that there's a huge difference in risk depending on how somebody gets nicotine. And uh, things like cigarette smoking are particularly deadly. And we also know that like so many other behaviors, so many other products, substitution is easier than total cessation. To, to give people an option to, as, as we have done for so many things, to say, we can give you an alternative. We can empower you to make decisions that are better for your health. And to ban the low risk products and therefore protect the very high risk products, I think is a very poor strategy. I mean, that just guarantees more death and disease. And instead we can try to in encourage the development of ever, ever better technology that gets people off cigarettes. Uh, also products that are far less toxic than many of the oral products currently sold in India. I mean, te technologically, this is not very difficult. And as you say, we're, we're seeing it in other countries. And I think the idea that this isn't just theoretical, you know, we know that, that countries that have had access to low risk alternatives have seen much more rapid declines in cigarette smoking. You know, just like people who got access to cleaner needles, you know, saw reductions in, in the use of dirty needles or places with safer automobiles saw reduction in the use of, of more hazardous automobiles, it's substitution. And Japan, as you say, is, is, a, is a great example. Actually, by the first quarter of this year, cigarette sales are down by 46.5% compared to just six years ago. I mean, that's a phenomenal rate of progress. And that's just with one low-risk alternative being widely available without it being actively promoted and without using tax policy and differential advertising, you know, risk proportionate regulation to encourage people to move there. So we get an idea that we could probably have a very, very rapid move to low risk alternatives if we simply aligned policy in order to try to encourage that to happen. If we just did what we usually do in public health of understanding people's lived experience and empowering them to make better decisions about their own health. Yeah, thank you, um, David. Uh, I'll move on to Professor Pute. Um, off late, We've seen many sectors subject blanket bans on various, you know, um, habits that are in society. Uh, and this seems to be rather heavy on ideology, but very light on research. Uh, how can consumer rights and policies as a general practice become more rooted in scientific findings and broadly speaking, become more evidence-based? Professor Kutte? Yeah, thank you very much, Rini, for the question. I think this is uh, a, an issue that has uh, been widely debated in many countries, including, uh, I suppose, in India as well as, as, well as in Malaysia. Um, there are a lot of voices from the consumers, but sometimes um, the con voices from the consumers are seen as secondary or basically you know, un unintelligent sometimes. And, and this uh, really puts consumers in a very bad view they are always assumed as uh, not enough knowledge or they don't have enough research uh, backing them up. And this creates a disproportion where there's a lot of findings that has not been revealed or selectively been revealed to the consumers. Um, for me personally, I think the most important thing is for the consumers or the consumers association, there must be very strong consumers association pushing the agenda. And this cannot go on without the support by other societies as well. The government needs to be neutral in this sense because the government needs to have some leeway for consumers to actually address their issue and to be intelligent enough 
to address what would be you know most uh, suitable for them as well. This should be led by scientific research and evidence-based medicine, which is actually widely available. However, in some cases, access of these uh, findings or journal or scientific findings may not be uh, accessible or would be very selectively viewed by the consumers uh, groups as well. So this is very important where the consumers need to actually engage with scientific uh, leaders or scientific community as well to actually have what is the latest evidence of certain products. Example, the reduced risk products as well. In certain countries, including in Malaysia, this is not widely seen as something palatable for the population and for the consumers to adhere to. And it is seen as something which is considered negatively. So I think the consumers need to make up their agenda. A good health literacy would be very beneficial for them to actually address which research can they actually propagate and so on. And they should not take research which is probably secondary or not evidence-based. And this should be led by each country and each researchers in their own country to propel the research forward. So basically, it's a collective effort. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pote. Um, our um, speaker from uh, uh, the, hospi the hospital uh, situation, as it were, Dr. Kiran Melkote, um, I've been watching you as you were listening to the uh, other speakers um, and you've been smiling and nodding your head and listening to them quite intently. And we know that you are quite vocal and active on social media and other fora about the challenges of tobacco control. The end game for tobacco by 2045. This is not a new idea, but we all know that bans simply do not work. What do you think should be the pragmatic strategy or approach? I didn't mean Thank you for your question. And it is very nice to be quoted in the opening uh, speech. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> I think the first thing we need to do is we need to sort of delink, we need to sort of delink nicotine and tobacco. I was listening to what Dr. Madan Gopal was saying. Uh, actually speaking, if you if you if you just if you just if you just look at nicotine, it is not, it is not in fact carcinogenic. But uh, due to the due to the various Due to the various policies and propaganda, it has sort of become uh, fact right now. It has become accepted fact where you know we all think that the major problem is in nicotine, but that is not the case. Now, the idea of an end game of tobacco has become popular once again. So this calls for a way to completely eradicate tobacco from a society by about 2045. In a way, this is a recognition that so far, so far the WHO and various governments have done very little to address the problem of tobacco. Sure, they've actually gone after the ancillary aspects of smoking, for example, smoking in public places, ad bans, tobacco packaging, warnings, all these things, yes. But to ban tobacco itself, there was a there was a recent article I just read in the paper a few days back. So there was, there's a very well-known, there's a very well known based in Mumbai, and he's also part of the WHO and he's also part of the government groups. So he was saying that since the quit rates are so low in India, all our efforts should stop focusing on cessation clinics and mm -hmm. instead focus on reducing the uptake of the next generation. So we have 267 tobacco users. So what this gentleman says is you just forget about these people. We can't save them anyway. We have very low quit rates. Let's go, let's try to stop more people from getting in. So I think that actually exposes. This is an admission that our efforts towards complete tobacco cessation have largely failed. And instead of introspection, we want to abandon the 267 million current tobacco users to their fates. Now, bans are very popular as a sign of taking strong action. But as rightly said, they just don't work. We have refused to run from history, whether it was alcohol prohibition in the USA, whether it was alcohol prohibition again in Gujarat. And some countries like Bhutan have even banned cigarettes. And if you just look at our country, we have banned vaping and we have banned commerce in vapes since uh, since about three years ago. But all this has, what it had done is, it was just doomed to failure. It has simply pushed vaping underground and anyone with a mobile phone and half a brain can just get their vape straight away. It's not a big problem right now. And there's even a, there's even a very nice document which is about to be released. It is by noted filmmaker, uh, it is by noted filmmaker Aman Mahajan. So he was actually, he's actually gone around showing how this ban has failed and how easy it is to get vapes on the ground in India right now. 
So I think if we learn from all these things, the what we should be doing, the pragmatic approach would be to learn from past mistakes. We take a few steps back and look at the big picture. What are we trying to achieve? Do we want to save lives? Do we want to make lives better from disease? Or do we just want to eradicate tobacco and nicotine? I think that has to be the real question. What are we doing in public health? Isn't it all about saving lives and bettering lives? So I think uh, if, we, if we just look at the concept of tobacco harm reduction, okay, vapes are banned in India, I agree. But we still have other we still have other NRTs. These are part of the WHO toolkit. These are these are actually uh, these are actually endorsed by the WHO. So we have nicotine patches, pouches, gums, lozenges. These are available in India. Why can't we subsidize them? And that was a very good point made by Dr. Madan Gopal that you know the people from the lower socioeconomic strata who actually use our smokeless tobacco cannot afford it. So why can't we subsidize it? You know, if we actually look at it, the main problem in India is smokeless tobacco. But instead, we have the COTPA, which stands for the Cigarettes and Other, other which actually stands for the Cigarettes and Other Tobacco Products Act. Cigarette smokers in our country are 28 million out of 267 million. But we name the act as Cigarettes and Other Tobacco Products. That itself tells us where our focus is. And if you, if you just look at something which is more dangerous than cigarettes, which is BDs, we have 78 million BD smokers. Nobody looks at them. They're invisible because they're in the social, I mean, they're in the lowest, they are in the lower, they're in the lower social strata. So they just become invisible. Their problems become invisible to us. And I think that focus needs to change. If you're looking at tobacco harm reduction as a whole, if you can transition, okay, let's just let's just look at the entire problem. And the best way for a smoker to on to a less risky product is to go for a vaping or for a heated tobacco product, which is not available in India. So if you look at the if you look at the other groups, which is the which is the which is the larger majority, about 200 million of people use smokeless tobacco. So if we can transition them to existing products like for example nicotine patches or pouches or even some sort of lozenges or gums, that would make a big difference. Instead of just waging an ideological war on tobacco where 8 million people die every year, and I think this is something we need to we need to understand. We can no longer afford to ignore harm reduction. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Dr. Malpote. I think you've made a lot of valid points, and uh, uh, we really thank all the speakers for their vital inputs. Um, but let me ask all of you to kind of you know, given your uh, thoughts as it were on this. I mean, it's a fact that India has around three hundred million tobacco users. And the government's goal, as, as even Dr. Madhugopal has mentioned, is to reduce tobacco usage uh, by around 30% by 2030. Uh, is this really an achievable target? Will it happen? I mean, as Dr. Milpote has mentioned, there's an absence of widespread harm reduction awareness and even availability of the products. Uh, let's, let's have all your, your thoughts on this. Uh, we'll start with David. Sure. I, I think that we can achieve goals uh, on reducing the mortality, the morbidity of, of tobacco use very rapidly. And, and I think, as, as we've just heard, we need to distinguish between nicotine and, uh, and the harms caused by the delivery. So if we wanted to reduce the, the tobacco-related health costs of the, the death, the disease, reducing that by 30%, we can do that very rapidly simply by having less hazardous products. Uh, the, the products that we have now, uh, the cigarettes, the biddies, the uh, various other products, they're toxic uh, and unnecessarily so when we look at what's being used in other countries. So we could reduce that very, very quickly. We have seen, as I said, with Japan reducing cigarette sales by over 46% in just six years. Norway reduced cigarette sales by half in just 10 years. and and we've seen success elsewhere. And, and again, many of these places did not use a lot of policy to do this. We could speed that up. So I think that we could see a 30% reduction in the use of toxic, toxic tobacco products in two years. I mean, that it, it should be quicker than that if, if we simply empowered people to make better decisions. We had a range of better products. We allowed a market to function to solve the problem 
that we have with tobacco caused illness. So uh, it, it is there is probably one of the easiest public health victories that we could have. And it's a major one. We just have to start using economics to our advantage and markets to our advantage, rather than fighting these changes, rather than denying consumers access to low risk products. So David, you've raised the point about consumers being key to this uh, you know, entire exercise. Uh, let me go to Professor Pute. Uh, you've talked about consumer uh, rights and consumer information need needed for something like this to actually roll out on the ground. Um, how much do you think is going to be uh, possible in our race to reduce uh, tobacco consumption and perhaps just to seize with Right. I think the consumers, especially the population who are involved in trying to push this agenda, need to make it a public agenda and, and put it side into media and things like that. It becomes a national policy agenda. If this is propagated, propagated uh, widely enough and correctly done, of course, uh, it can propel the government to actually sway into the harm reduction uh, arm and basically uh, hopefully be able to cater for our widespread uh, harm reduction awareness. At the moment, if this is being done selectively, meaning that you know, uh, some information or awareness on harm reduction are being uh, suppressed, it will not reach the public and it will actually cause more harm to the population. And this is why uh, knowledge and awareness needs to be propagated downwards and it goes down to the population. And who should do, be doing this? This should be led not only by the consumers, but again, like I've mentioned uh, repeatedly, it has to also come from the health stroke, the, the, the health side, but also from the medical line. We have a lot of researchers here, example, Dr. Kiran, Dr. Madan, and so on. And the, you need to help also as, as well, uh, propel this knowledge downwards to the population together with the consumer groups or a few pro-harm reduction societies in your country. This needs to go into the political agenda because the politicians are able to sway the government. Sometimes it doesn't not come from the population itself, but you know we go through the to some politicians who are on our side, and hopefully we are able to convince them enough with the research, with the data showing that how other countries have emerged successfully, especially the developed countries, and reduce almost half of their population into non-smoking population. This should be one of the examples that we need to tell our researchers, our government, that these are happening elsewhere and we are lost in this transition. If we don't actually help the consumers, but also the medical side to actually notice this trend, we are going to lose behind and we are not able to achieve the 30% in the year 2030. And this is going to be very frustrating for everyone, especially the population itself, not only because of death, but because of the huge amount of cost that's going to burden the government. And I, I think I, I wish all the, the researchers here uh, good luck and, and hopefully that you are able to sway, especially to societies and so forth, to sway the government's uh, you know, policies into harm reduction as well in, in your country. Thank you very much, Professor Kote. I'm sure we need more than luck to get this through. Um, Dr. Kiran Milkote, you've been, you know, listening very carefully yes. and I know raring to go, um, but <laughs> I, I want to just bring you back to, you know, the fight seems to be between government and, you know, the um, uh, consumer as it were. Uh, where is the, where is the industry trying to propel change? Why can't the industry and say the medical fraternity get together and say, okay, we're going to change the, you know, the, the entire concept of uh, tobacco consumption or tobacco cessation, can we not get them to put their forces together? We can, we can, but uh, just before that, I'd just like to address one thing. Now, we have been talking about a 30% reduction. I, I think even, even it was mentioned by Dr. Madan Gopal initially. Uh, if you look at the exact wording, it's not 30% reduction, it's 30% relative reduction. This is framing. It's just framing. We're, we're really playing with words here. I mean, yes. on the ground, on the ground, how is the change going to actually, you know, be so what, yes. So What this means is, if you look at the levels of smoking, if you look at the levels of tobacco use in 2010, that is your baseline. And by 2025, we want to reduce that to around 7%. That will make it a relative reduction of about 30%. It's not absolute reduction. Absolute yes. reduction would be around 82 million people 
and if you look at the if you uh, that is just in india if you look at the relative reduction it's going to be about 19 million 19 so that's the difference and 19 million people to sort of quit tobacco i think the death rates itself will take care of that doing nothing will let us achieve it will actually easily let us exceed the 30% relative targets that is that is really problem. not what we want exactly that's framing unfortunately we are talking about 30% relative reduction we should be talking about 30% absolute reduction and that is possible if we try and implement thr by thr i, I of course mean tobacco harm reduction so if yes. we try that i think it is absolutely possible to exceed even about 30% that that should not be a problem at all and here we're looking at you know it's a long period 15 year period you're trying and i'll just give you an example the death rate in india is 1.35 million every year the quit rate in india is 1.15 million every year the death rate exceeds the quit rate so even if you just sit and do nothing you will achieve the 30% target which you want to call 30% actually 30% relative target so i think there is a lot more we should be doing now going back to your question regarding uh, i mean see there is uh, there is a there is a lot of mistrust about tobacco industries there's actually because of uh, various factors historically and it is in cases it's a well deserved mistrust but if you actually look at it i think if you want to if you want to uh, if you want to get these products at a lower price points if you want to get these products into as many markets as possible i don't think that's possible without any sort of you can't do it without big industry involvement and if there's a big industry who's actually majorly into tobacco and if they want to go into tobacco harm reduction or if they want to make reduced risk products i think we should be welcoming it but there have been so many cases for example if you look at uh, the whole i mean when uh, the one case last year when uh, the makers of alboro they actually tried to ban the company in the uk it was all over the news vectura so yes. it was uh, yeah so it was it was uh, lambasted across the spectrum by healthcare professionals so you know i think that sort of mistrust has to go and if you actually think about it ultimately those on the side of thr and those in the those on the other side we are all working towards the same goal we have to we have to sort of find a way to reach across the aisle we have to find a way to we have to find a way to debate and you know we have a we have a we have the same goals so there has to be some meeting ground there has to be some common ground there thank you um, dr melkote uh, dr madan gopal your last words the meeting round that uh, dr melkote mentioned can the government rise up to the situation and and say okay we're going to get all the key players and the stakeholders involved and make the change on the ground possible it is quite possible uh, the the encouragement which we have seen with the smoking in public places that's quite encouraging if people are involved you can see it can become a movement now the bollywood actors also they have started talking about reduction in the smoking aspects we are trying we are working in that direction one of the important thing which is there the felt need that means felt need of the population is they want to have access to tobacco products we should be very conscious of the fact that this is their need because they have been introduced in their early life and now we want to this banning and regulation they have their own role but it's the awareness of the people the participation of the people will, will which will make change we do have a network of uh, uh, network of community health volunteers as well as the health structure is there they have also been roped in the one of the modules is uh, we are trying to build one of the modules so that they are uh, they are also the health volunteers are also there apart from that as the professor phuket has told we have to make committees at the village level as we are doing in the district mental health program we they, these committees they will move it has to start from there if people are aware if they say that we don't need it then obviously the there would be reduction in consumption unless and until the need comes from the people side it would be very difficult uh, to say that ki whether we will achieve or not that movement is going on and the efforts are made in the right direction we are moving in that direction Thank you very much, and we've almost come to the end of this segment. Um, thank you, our speakers, Dr. Madan Gopal, David Sweena, uh, Professor Kote, and Dr. Kiran Nalkote.
um, with that special session that we had on enabling the shift to less harmful substances, evidence-based policy recommendations here at the Economic Times Consumer Freedom Conclave 2022 we come to a close. We trust that you found the insights uh, shared of value to you. Thank you for tuning in. It's back to Ivan Rodriguez now. Thank you so much, Rini. That was a very encouraging uh, discussion, evidence-based policy recommendations on enabling the shift to less harmful alternatives. On behalf of the Economic Times, I'd like to thank David Sweener, Dr. Kiran Melkote, Dr. K. Madan Gopal, and Sharifa Izzat Wanpute for taking valuable time off from their very busy schedules and joining us for this panel discussion at the Consumer Freedom Conclave. We wish you and your respective organizations the very best going forward. And Rini, thank you for doing a fantastic job of moderating this panel. Do stay tuned in, ladies and gentlemen. We will be back on the other side in a few minutes from now with the second panel discussion.